Hey guys, Chris Brown here with Shockwave and Murmur. Uh, I got Joe Walsh with me, director of um, uh, Structural Heart at St. Alphinius in Boise. Joe, I got this case I want you to look at with me, man. Uh, wondering what you think you would do here and uh, sort of how you would treat it. This is the diagnostic from one of our um, satellite centers. They, uh, they got in that left main and then they decided to pop it out because they didn't like what they saw. When I didn't Step really number like one, it. do a good angiogram. That's the yeah. script's credo, right? Yeah, I didn't like what they saw either. <laughs> so then they took this picture, which oh, was a nasty. angiogram, and they're like, mm, we should probably take this out that's too. Nasty. I actually ag agree with the technique here, which is <laughs> get out of there. Yeah, try not to dissect it, get a minimal picture. And this is always, honestly, this is a whole conversation of itself, like crazy tight left main, you know, how good of pictures do you do for your surgeon to graft arteries, yeah. you know? And I think it's common. I, my surgeons are always like, I don't know what the hell to graft to. But anyway, so nasty left main looks like an occluded cirque. Yeah, and then, and and then it's sort of subtotaled or occluded right. I mean, you can kind of very vaguely see that in the background there, it fills in really late. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of got like, maybe you got a little channel or a bridge. I think you probably got a channel. They didn't take any more pictures, of course. They put a, a balloon pump in and put a swan in and said, uh, we, hasta la vista, this gentleman. So they sent him on down to us. Um, we optimized them the best we could. Actually got them to pretty low filling pressures, but still an LVEDP of like 30. EF's pretty poor, as you can imagine, around in the, in the teens. Um, seen by CT surgery, of course, and felt to not be a, a person that needed to have surgery uh, or that would tolerate surgery. So we went with a, a supported PCI. You know, he's a really small person, and so I would have, I, I considered using a 5.5. Five. I mean, people whose EFs are in the teens, I don't know about you, but we strongly consider 5.5s five in those patients just because they, the amount of support you get from a CP is good, but it's not perfect. Um, but he's real tiny. He weighs like 55 kilograms or something. And Ooh. so I think that an Impella CP is, is adequate support for somebody of that body habit. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to escalate a CP to ECMO. Um, I've done a couple 5.5 five five supported cases. It's just a little, it's a little unwieldy because you have to have your surgeon put it in and then, you know, you rest them and then they have to take it out. So I think from a utilization perspective, I think a CP is good for 99% of the cases. And then the 1% you have to escalate. I think and, it's reasonable. And the people that are as compensated as we can. Um, so, you know, we we like to take the impella out as soon as possible. You know, we understand that they say there's no hemolysis and all this stuff, but the least number of days that this mechanical device is in, as long as you're appropriately unloaded and adequately like sort of taken care of and not being flogged by dobutamine, I think is probably what's best. Yeah. And this is the case though, I'd put the impella and I'd say, you know, this is, this is somebody we probably won't take it out when we're done. Yeah. You know, maybe just and to wrap them. I don't and, know. And that's what we do. We, we, what we do here and you'll see what we do is we talked, we have a, a, essentially a heart team meeting at the end of the case. We bring advanced heart failure downstairs with the ICU doctor and the anesthesiologist. And we say, look, these are the numbers. This is where we're at. This is us at P2 or P4. What this is what the anesthesiologist has them on support wise. What does everybody want? And people sort of put in their two cents and they, um, we make a decision together. So I love that dude. So procedural strategy, obviously I think in these cases, you know, there's two, there's two, there's theories, right? So the first theory is just do the CTOs. Cause if you fail in them, then maybe surgery is going to be a better option, even though this guy's already been declined. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is get the open myocardium open, get the LED open, Rota, probably shockwave and then work on the CTOs once that's that's kind of revascularized. What, what was your procedural strategy? Yeah, I'm a fix what's open when you can first, especially because in this case, if you're gonna fix that right and you need a retrograde conduit, you're looking at it. Yeah. And you're not working point. through this, so at least not in its current state. And so unfortunately, I, from my perspective, you gotta fix it. And you can see there's septals that are pretty robust and they're not filling the right particularly well because there is some competitive flow from the right itself. But this is, you know, these septals I can work. These are these are totally usable collaterals for me. So we went straight straight to Rota. I mean, you could dilly dally in my opinion and try pragmatic predilation, but this degree of calcification I think requires that you not only debulk to a certain degree, but also uh, from my perspective, we just save time. There's just no, there's Dude, the number I was of say minutes the same thing. this person it's, it's like is on the, the table is, is critical. 
I, I 100% agree, and I don't think people realize that. Like, like going Rota up front in these cases, yes, you can do it with pragmatic NC balloons or even shockwave, but you're going to significantly limit your ischemic time, and yep. your ability to deliver things is going to be greatly augmented by just rotoing up front. Just do like three or four runs. It doesn't have to get fancy. So one seven, one seven five or one five burr. One five, because I can't tell how big that distal vessel is. I know it's probably yeah. based on this like apical part. You know, it's probably about as big as my seven French guide, maybe a little smaller. So I feel comfortable that I can pretty much rota anywhere that I want in this calcified segment with a one five burr. One seven five burr, it probably still would have been safe. Um, but we just did the one five. It gives us the deliverability that we want. We got this one little tiny diagonal that started to have a bit of slow flow, and so we we ivised up front. We found what we thought was a healthy landing zone here, just at the edge of this calcium. So the, yeah. this little tiny portion is probably actually intramyocardial. Uh, it's very small. You can kind of see how it dilates out after that, and there's no actual plaque in it. So we opted to say it's either intramyocardial or it's spasm to some degree, and there's no actual plaque in the ivis run, which I can show you. Um, and so you know, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to spend too much time thinking about that. And we, we went ahead and wired that little, little diag and ballooned it just to save it. So it looked better. And then we went ahead and went with lithotripsy, um, from the calcified part all the way back. And I don't know how you size these now, but I size, I oversize them. So I, yeah. I size this to the proximal reference so we can cal we can do that part. And I essentially just go with the idea that at four atmospheres, it doesn't really do much distally as far as like risk for rupture or trauma. There's a real epidemic of undersizing balloons. Like I've seen how some of my partners and other folks are using Shockwave and I feel I feel like people are are like routinely undersizing them, but it's really not a big deal at all. And I don't I just don't think I think there's so much more downside to undersizing than oversizing in my opinion. Agreed. So we got pretty good expansion with that lithotripsy and we decided to try and nail this. This is probably a 275 stent. It's probably a little oversized distally, but that's okay. Uh, we, we're going to hammer that home. And then, you know, here we have no idea where the circ is. There are no clear collaterals that I can see from the right or the left. And so we're going to kind of just say, look, we're going to abandon the idea that we're going to go get this circ CTO. Um, and if we are going to go get it, we're just going to have to cross a stent at some point, but we got to finish, uh, you know, this work up front. No, and I think that's a I think that's a reasonable strategy. All right, so osteal yeah. landing for your stent. What angle do you like? Are you an LAO cranial guy? Yeah, you got to be LAO cranial. Sometimes you got to be straight LAO. It re what really matters is, of course, that you can see the cusp in a meaningful way. So you can see oh, that's here gorgeous. we've moved to, to LAO twenty seven cranial ten to make this landing. So you can clearly see the delineation of where the cusps meets the coronary, and so where you need to land the stent. And so we. Um, we just moved to that position and we're just trying to make sure we have distal coverage and we're back to our straight LEO here. This is actually LEO 30. Uh, I feel like people get a little lazy with osteo left mains. Like everyone's really, you know, like they take their time with osteo rights. You really want to nail it. But like the left mains really, I think it's a lot more important to nail the left main. Yeah, I agree. CT studies show that LEO cranial is the best view. So I think that's great. Awesome. So you, we big hammered spend. this out. We like this. And you can see how much more robust the septal flow is now too, right? So totally. now we've really gotten that inferior wall to get some blood flow. And I can show you the IVUS real quick. Um, I'll probably just show you one of them. And so this is an Avigo, right? Yeah, uh, this is an Avigo Plus. You can see small, small vessel, no significant plaque, probably in an intramyocardial bridge, and then comes to the tissue. There's our calcium where we decided to land our stent. This is me trying to go back and forth, trying to make sure I figure out exactly where to land angiographically. So I'm trying to fluoro and move my ibis all at the same time. So you, yeah, so I think best practices for a Vigo that I found is essentially you, you go down to where you think the normal segment is. You go on manual, you yep. pull back a little bit. And then if you want to use the, the automated pullback feature, you start from where you think the landing zone is after reviewing it on live. Yeah. And kind of we, we don't even do that. We, what we do is we put it on manual and we find the healthy landing zone and we dry Sine and we tell them to bookmark and we just pull back manually the whole way. It's just gotcha. as fast, if not faster than the automatic. And we can stop in different points and you can actually go in and out and you know where you are because there's the pullback back length. So I don't have to worry about mislengthening the stent or anything because it says, you know, I bookmarked here, it was at seven millimeters and I bookmarked here, it was at 47 millimeters. I need 40 millimeters of stent. It doesn't matter how much in and out I do looking at where the diag is or whatever kind of thing I'm trying to assess. I can do it and it, I'll still know the length that I wanted. It, I didn't know that. So that you can still get the length because the sled is kind of like monitoring. It's how far monitoring where you are all the time. So you can go in and out on manual and you still get exactly the length that you want. Okay. No, I like that. And then you're, you know, for the inpatient cardiologist waiting for the, you know, two, two millimeters per second pullback is kind of painful sometimes. Oh, right. I mean, 
there's nothing that I'd rather do less than wait for something, which is crazy because <laughs> it, these procedures take way longer than two minutes, but I completely agree. But it adds up, dude. I mean, I think that those little tricks that you can do to cut down the time of these cases, it makes the lab happier. It makes the patient happier. Your ischemic time goes down. That's, that's great. Yeah. So that's circumferential. Yeah. It's uh, and so that was what it was. And, I'm trying to, it didn't actually have a particularly big gutter because, well, it is what it is. I'm trying to get you back here to, you know, show so Chris, you. when you're using, I've like, so you just use Ivis post rota. Are you still, are you evaluating the calcium on your imaging to determine whether or not you're going to rota shock as opposed to just rota or are you doing it more empirically? No, I'm doing it empirically. The rota is not penetrating deep. It's, it's not modifying deep calcium. It makes me a gutter sometimes. It allows me to deliver equipment, but I sort of firmly believe that we are to a point where you could go in with an NC and dilate some of these things and they'll probably relieve. Um, but given the degree of calcification that we see in a lot of these patients, I, I, there's so much calcium that's so much deeper that if I can turn it into sand or dust, for a lack of a better term, I'm going to get way better stent expansion, way better uniformity. And I, I think, and I'll, you know, I'll show you some data in a little bit later, I think I'm going to improve the safety profile of the, the patient I'm treating by really decreasing my risk of, of you know, taking an NC to 24 to get my stent to expand even after I rota and not perforate something. So. Yeah, dude, that looks great. And then, so after you wrote a shock, are you still taking an NC balloon down just to confirm? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, so you go maybe. Rota, Ivis, shock, And NC. then we NC one-to-one yeah. -one to make sure that we're expanded. And Got then it. we deploy our stents to high pressure. And honestly, sometimes that means we don't have to post-dilate our stents. Um, because yeah, if, you, that's a good point. if you expand your stents at high pressure and you've already done all the pre-work, the stents normally expand pretty well. This is me taking a world's worst angiogram because I'm not actually engaged. <laughs> here's the right. You can see. I like the approach of just leaving the EBU in. So you yeah. went single access and then where was your second access from? We Looks put like a radial that. sheath in. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So we, you know, we know that we may need to use a retrograde conduit here. And even if we didn't, we wanted to be able to visualize and not have to deal with, and, you know, what we were doing. And we thought we might be able to ADR distally if we had to. Um, so we came to this cap. Uh, we used our guide extension for support. We were prepared to ADR, just cork this thing off if we had to. Um, you can see there's maybe a channel there, honestly. Yeah. Um, I can get into like a little branch with the Gladius Mongo here. So I can get a polymer wire and then I'm able to kind of make my way. And we're probably true to true. There probably was a whole channel there the whole time. Oh dude, that's gorgeous. So question, Chris, when you're, when you're doing some of these CTO cases, you know, it's a real thing. The Abiumed people talk about this, but like when you put an impella in, you actually often get better coronary flow. So you get better angiograms. Yep. Do you find, is that, is that real? Do you oh, find Absolutely. That? I think the, right. your coronary perfusion pressure across the myocardium is, is dramatically improved because you know, this guy's EDP was 20, 29. Right. So by unloading him, the, the perfusion pressure of 120 or 120, whatever my anesthesiologist is able to pump him up to systolic, that person, um, is now has, a, you know, the mean arterial pressure minus whatever the new EDP is, is the perfusion pressure. And it's just much, much better. Um, so we got across this and of course, because I'm intraluminal or I think I'm intraluminal, I'm like certain that we're not going to be able to do anything, but rotate the crap out of this. And we rotated this for actually a long time. This is actually one of the first cases in the last two years. Um, probably the third case that I've had to actually exchange the burr for another burr because we, wow. burred, we burred for about five minutes. Um, in total, we had done some, you know, a minute and a half or something in the LAD total. And we were able to, um, burr here we had to switch burrs and then we escalated uh burr speed we had started at 185 and i went to 200 and or 210 and i did the last probably two minutes of burring so you got about six minutes total on this artery at 210 just to get across this but you can see us i floor stored this i don't normally remember to do this but i was pretty excited when oh uh, yeah the curtis like, finish move God. once you cross like you remember that curtis used to always do that once you cross floor safe you know, it's just like, it's basically like a, a success, success marker right here. Exactly. It's, Talk it's about speed. Cause I think a lot of people are still clung to that, like random Asian data that says yeah. high speed causes real re reflow. I know most it, of you. It probably CCO does now. in that it, it activates platelets, but if you're appropriately platelet inhibited beforehand, which we are for all of these cases, these people are loaded, you know, days before. And if you have appropriate ACT and if you do the other things that you can do, I mean, and this is sort of anecdotal, but you know, some of the best data for no reflow or the only data for no reflow is that intracoronary epinephrine that you and Aiden, I think have done a video on. We do that um, preemptively. So really? I give intracoronary epinephrine 
and nitroglycerin before we even start to run the rota. And we haven't had to give theophylline or atropine or anything since we started doing that. No it way. makes the patients mildly, hyper, mildly tachycardic because of the epi, and we don't have any more no reflow. We do this for our laser cases now too, especially on contrast, and we have not had any uh, no reflow since we started doing that. So we essentially- How much are you giving? Where do you give it from? I'm giving it through the guide, and I'm giving between 25 and 50 micrograms, and then about 200 of nitro. That, no, that's fantastic. I like that. I mean, a lot of people will bring them to vasodilators, but I think that's a, that's a really elegant approach because it takes care of the hemodynamic concerns too. Exactly. It makes them tachycardic, so I don't have to worry about the bradycardia in the right coronary. It vasodilates the capillary bed better than anything else. I mean, nitrates are nitrates, but the reality is that there's a reason that when you run away from a tiger that your epinephrine is what lets your heart go a million miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, this is us after Rhoda. We, we like this a lot. I mean, this is dramatic improvement. Yeah, that looks great, man. Um, so we had this weird thing where distally there was actually a piece of calcium. So what we did was we did our lithotripsy here and we just used, thank God we had 120 pulses because it was, you know, that's a lot of calcium. We, you can see here distally there's some more stuff. We didn't rode a pass down here because I couldn't really see it in the in the beginning. So I didn't know how bad it was. So we only rode it to a, like around this corner. So we stented the part we knew that we had modified correctly with the plan to um, go and dilate distally um, and, and with the idea that we didn't necessarily think it was bigger than two five, and so I wasn't really going to take another rotaburr all the way down there. We were able to get a one five to Keru, which is a ridiculously deliverable balloon, um, down. And then using our guide extension to protect our newly placed stents, we did some NC with the non-compliant. We got good expansion, so we we're pretty happy. And well, dude, a couple points with that that I think are really important learning points. First, when you're rotoing, go a little farther than you think. I think Always. it's a common it's a common yeah. rookie mistake where you get the bad part of calcium and you kind of leave some distal stuff and then you regret it when you're trying to push gear through after Agreed. that. And it's super common. I think and a lot of people- You can hear it, right? Yeah. You're going and you get past where you think you want, but then there's still that whistling and there's still that sound of contact with calcium. And it's like, no, I should go a little farther because this is still making a lot of noise and it's still not going forward very easy past this one little part. And it's like, that's that secret lesion, you know? Yeah, totally, dude. We and just then the missed second... that here completely. We went past the calcium to this healthy part where we thought we were past, but we just did not visualize this. Fortunately, we got lucky and we were able to modify this calcium appropriately with the non-compliant balloons. But uh, it certainly added an extra ten minutes to my day or whatever trying to ram one five to carry across with a guide extension. No, totally. And, then, and I think the second rookie mistake people make is fresh stents. Oh, and you have to go distal, always put a guide extension catheter through them. Don't mess around putting, you know, stents through fresh stents and getting stuck and hung up and then the stent embolizes. Nice. And it just protects the stent anyway and the, the new stents, you know, they're, they're not fragile, but it's like, why, you know? Yeah. So we finished this off and let's get to the final. Here's our final. Oh, one. dude. I'm pretty happy. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I mean, that's, a, that's a, near complete revascularization, I think. And that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, I think this is as far as we're going to get him. And interestingly, his EDP had actually improved slightly. Um, he had made a good bit of urine. Um, we had some concern because his urine had actually started to turn dark. Um, now, whether he just had some, some irritation in his bladder from the Foley and we just gave him enough heparin at the ACT of 350 to cause that, or whether we were having a problem or we didn't want to waste time and wait with the Impella if we could. So we brought the team down. Everybody looked through it. He's on two Olivo, no other support, doing fine has a good pulse pressure of about 60 points. And so we said, okay, we're open. We think we've fixed the EDP to a certain degree that we can. And, and frankly, you know, we waited 20 minutes on P2. He did fine. And we didn't have any more room to diurese him anyway because his RA pressure was already like four. So we were, we were kind of as optimized as we could get. And so the heart failure team asked us to take it out. And so we took it out and uh, he did really well. Dude, that's great. I, I love that idea of the heart team discussion for impella room. I mean, do you do that for every protected PCI you do? Yep. Really? Yep. We just wow. call upstairs uh, to our heart failure guys. They know that we're going to call. They know we're you know going to bother them about it. They they actually prefer it because if they want it to be left in, they want to be able to make that decision. They don't want to have to come back and and talk to us about it later. Um, and so 